when I did switch over to the Mets, I, I, I remember talking with him about it and just letting him know like, hey, I'll be changing jobs. Uh, I appreciate the relationship, the professional relationship that we've had as a reporter, ex baseball executive covering your team. And he said something along the lines of like, man, baseball in New York, it's really special. And, and I just, that just always stuck with me. It was like a kind of a throwaway line, right? Like it's everybody kind now. of says that, but I, I kind of knew in the back of my mind that it would be pretty relevant someday probably. Um, but that also told me that like, man, this guy, he's not, he's not in it just to succeed at like a small market or just like, you know, I, I think he's really in it to be like the guy and, and to lead this organization, the, the, the organization that he grew up rooting for, like you suggested. Um, I mean, he's driven by that. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mets Pod, presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. Here's your reminder to subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome. As always, I am your host, Connor Rogers, joined as always by my co-host, Joe DeMeo, and a special guest, as you see him there. We have Will Salmon who covers the Mets, of course, for The Athletic. Will, you cover the Mets now, but you used to cover the Milwaukee Brewers, so who better to help us learn more about the soon-to-be, officially, Mets president of baseball operations, David Stearns. Before we get to all that, Will, how are you, man? Doing really well. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And yeah, covered the Brewers for three years or so before heading over to the Mets beat, so hopefully I have some, some knowledge to drop on the guy. Yeah, some are saying that David Stearns is now just following you at this point, but we won't confirm that. Listen, it's hard for the general public to know what these top level executives do. If a executive is in the press that often, it usually means they are highly respected around the industry. That's been the hype around Stearns for a while. But once again, it's hard for the general public to have an understand of what they specifically have done in their past. From what you know, what are some notable things that Stern specifically had a handle on during his time in Milwaukee? Yeah, it's well put, Connor. I think my brain, when you were saying that, it went to, well, when people are talking about an executive this often, it's probably negative. <laughs> it's not <Yeah>. overwhelmingly positive. <laughs> that's, right? that's a good point. <laughs> um, that's where my brain went. Uh, but yeah, I think that with, with David Stearns, so I covered him starting in 2020. And that was my first year covering baseball, actually. I had covered college football for a long time before that. So it's my first year covering it. I'm working uh, with The Athletic, and I'm getting to know David Stearns and Craig Council. And then after that, like after that experience, those couple of years there, I said to myself, wow, like there's no better two people to learn the game from than those two people, I thought. Because I just absorbed so much information, and I saw the game from several different angles that I otherwise wouldn't have even probably considered. And then um, maybe I'm, in my head I'm thinking, well, that's just because you're some college football reporter who decided to follow baseball and, and got into baseball more and pursued it. Uh, but no, it was like, yeah, everybody else says the same thing about these guys. And with David Stearns in particular, um, he, he's really good at a few different things that really, I guess, like put uh, that job in a – in a like a on a piece of paper as like a resume like what you would look what would you look for uh for me it comes down to also hiring like hiring is a big deal for that position like and what i mean by hiring it's like you see that position as the head of your department your head of your baseball but there's so many departments within that that you have to hire heads for um people who lead that whether it's your farm system whether it's your data analysis and anybody along those lines. And he's really, really good at identifying people that share his vision for what a successful organization looks like and helps put that in practice. And that's really what I saw predominantly with the, Brewer, with the Brewers is he really hired well with like his player development people. He got the most out of these guys um, who, yeah, going back to just the idea of who Dave Stearns is. Yeah, he's really good at evaluating talent and he often wins trades and he often wins transactions. But part of that is because he gets these players into a system where the guys that he hired can help them get a little bit better as well. So it's that great combination of knowing how to identify talent, perhaps in places where other people aren't looking, and then finding a way to get the most of that, which boils down to being a really good, a really good uh, person at hiring other people to execute your vision. 
you mentioned you were learning a lot from David Stearns and, and Craig Council just to get into the world of baseball. Uh, tell us some of your personal experiences with David Stearns and kind of what kind of person are the Mets getting to run their baseball department? Because we could talk about winning trades, losing trades, transactions, and that's, I guess, ultimately what the fans care about. But what kind of person are the Mets bringing into the organization? Well, when David Stearns walks into really any room, he probably will be the smartest person in that room. I mean, he's a Harvard graduate. He's a very well-educated man. Um, he's very into baseball. I, I remember distinctly joking with him one time about, like, what else do you do? And it was like a long list of baseball-related activities, I felt like. Um, but he's a, I would assume he's a bit more well-rounded than that. But, no, I, I think, like, when it comes down to, like, the person that I saw also like behind the job while also giving some insight into how he looks at the job. When you mentioned Joe, like the transactions and winning those, I often like thought that some of the moves that he made were kind of hard to see the why behind it right away. And one example that really came to mind was when he traded for Willie Adamas with the Rays. Um, at the time they had Luis Arias, who by the way, was somebody that David Stearns really liked. Uh, he acquired Arias in a trade with the Padres. Um, not too long before that. But Arias was really struggling at that time. Um, and they had given him the job. They traded away Orlando Arcia to uh, the Braves and a move that did not really work out for Milwaukee in the long run. But it was the right move at the time because they wanted this uh, window for Arias to show what he's capable of. Turns out he really struggled. And I bring this one up because this was a move that really shed a lot of light for me onto how he makes moves and what he considers. And so for me, like I, I remember talking with him throughout Reyes' struggles and just wondering, like, what are they going to do here? Because this is somebody that they obviously clearly invested in. This is somebody that they eyed uh, externally as somebody that could help them, and he's not working out. So how long are they going to keep this status quo? Because, again, this was a 2021 Brewers team that was pretty good. We already knew right off the bat they'd have dominant pitching. That was the case all season. But they needed more from that position. And in particular, defensively, Arias was just not very good at that time. Um, so he goes out and he trades for Willie Adamas. And at the time, Willie Adamas is doing horrible. I mean, you could check the numbers. His uh, strikeout rate was sky high. Um, batting average, slugging, everything was way down. He was barely like, I think it was getting to the point with the Rays where they were considering, hey, maybe we got to move on from this guy. And this was the, the player that Stearns targeted and was like, no, we want this guy. They ended up trading uh, J.P. Fire Eisen, a, a pretty good reliever. Um, and Drew Rasmussen, who's really established himself as a pretty good starter before injuries, uh, got to him with the Rays. And so I was looking at that trade. I'm like, man, I don't, I don't really – I mean, I get it, but I don't. Like, I know you have to do something here at shortstop, but why this guy? And I just remember just thinking to myself, like, how bold that was. Um, and I think, like, in a market like Milwaukee, sometimes that could get a little bit, like – under the radar with that kind of move. Whereas here, you know, you trade for a shortstop who's like batting 190 and you're saying like, that's my guy. It's going to raise my eyebrows a little bit. Um, where and then Milwaukee, he did draw some criticism um, for it, but not to the degree that he would here. And I just remember him just being very, very convicted with this line of thinking that Adamus was, maybe he wasn't going to be like the leader that he became or like the the star player for them that he, that he kind of is for them. Um, but he thought he'd be what the team needed, which was a pretty solid fielding guy, somebody that they can count on, somebody who brought intangibles as a winning type of player. And so he made the move. And so for me, like Joe, when you mentioned like the guy and within the context of the moves that he makes, that's probably the best example I can give you, which sheds light on his personality, because he's going to be guided by what's best for this organization. Like not what's best for David Stearns and his track record and like giving a guy that he pointed to as the shortstop um no it's about what's better for the team and so for me like the ability to uh stay nimble and stay humble with like the idea of okay maybe i got that one wrong for now and do something else and that other thing was also pretty bold that's probably the best one i can give you as far as like a, a, a full picture of what david stearns can kind of bring from a transaction point of view well you know this market really well by now and you could argue that david stearns does too because he grew up in it as a fan the pressure most notably that comes with running the new york mets or even just being associated with the new york mets do you think it took a lot of convincing from steve cohen for stearns to sign on here and now be the guy i mean billy epler we know is going to fall under him steve cohen i think personally does a good job being a uh, vocal owner and addressing the fans but at the end of the day, the entire baseball operation is going to be on Stearns. I think he has to be aware of the pressure 
that comes with that when it's the New York Mets. Yeah, and Connor too. Like the idea is my th my line of thinking with David Stearns is like there was never really a number two guy either. So it's like it, it better he better be good at this, right? <laughs> like if you're yeah, Mets, we've heard this name like, for you know, years. Yeah, yeah. It's like okay, yeah. I can't remember another executive coming into this like sort of high level expectations, but and this is going to sound like I'm like really propping him up, but um, I just never really thought that he was somebody that ever really like lacked confidence in his ability. I, I just really don't. I wasn't around him. I wasn't around the team clearly when they traded away Josh Hader to the Padres. And so like maybe if I had covered that and because that obviously was a miscalculation on his part with how much that would impact the clubhouse, he openly has said that. I, I was covering the Mets by then. So I can't really speak to that. Um, so I didn't cover that transaction, but all the other ones, I just remember like a guy who was like really convicted, really confident. And I also remember um, when I did switch over to the Mets, I, I, I remember talking with him about it and just letting him know like, hey, I'll be changing jobs. Uh, I appreciate the relationship, the professional relationship that we've had as a reporter, ex baseball executive covering your team. And he said something along the lines of like, man, baseball in New York, it's really special. And, and I just, that just always stuck with me. It was like a kind of a throwaway line, right? Like everybody kind now. of says that, but I, I kind of knew in the back of my mind that it would be pretty relevant someday probably. Um, but that also told me that like, man, this guy, he's not, he's not in it just to succeed at like a small market or just like, you know, I, I think he's really in it to be like the guy and, and to lead this organization, the, the, the organization that he grew up rooting for, like you suggested. Um, I mean, he's driven by that. The only question that I would have is um, not really the pressure necessarily, um, but as far as like how much it took him to, to do it. Um, I, I do I do think that he was genuine with what he said about wanting to take some time off. Um, so as long as he's feeling like rejuvenated from that and like ready to roll, which clearly he would be if he's accepted this job, um, that would be my that would have been like my only not hesitation, but I think you mentioned the idea of like how much would it take. That probably would be more than the more than the expectations and more than the um, the pressure because I think he's kind of used to that, and I think he probably thrives off that like anybody else who's really you know excellent at what they do. So I've done my best to tell Mets fans why I think this is such a big deal. I said last week on our show that it was a momentous day for Mets for being able to bring David Stearns into the fold. Uh, in your opinion, if you could give the top two or three reasons, why should Met fans be excited that David Stearns is here? I think it comes down to your organization is going to get better, right? Like this, it, that's yeah. just the bottom line with this. It's just your organization from top to bottom is going to improve. And this is an organization that has really suffered from a lack of continuity in their front office. It, it's not, it doesn't just go back to Steve Cohen even, and it doesn't go back to Billy Epler by any means. It's before these guys, it's before those leaders that you have in place um, where they're like, they're, this is a team that's been desperate from even like a farm system, from a player development standpoint. Um, I mean, how many different farm directors has this team gone through in the past, you know, 10 years or so, or less than that, even five or six years? A lot, maybe may, it may be like one to one ratio or something, something yeah, pretty pretty close. Like it's yeah, really it's close. close to that. I don't think it's exactly one to one, but it's, it's yeah. close. It's not where you want to be. And I think I don't want to like blame all of that or like blame some like some players' struggles through the system on that. But it's part of it. If you have different people in your ear, different people like trying to tell you what to do, um, you need that sort of collective and that unity um, to kind of. I just feel like to be more cohesive as a unit. So he'll bring that, um, and that kind of goes to what I was saying about hiring and bringing the right people along with him. And then it's also like what we saw the past two years with the Mets, uh, maybe last season in particular, because this obviously has not gone the way that they wanted and probably wouldn't have mattered all that much. But I think winning in the margins with this with the Major League roster is a big deal, right? Um, that's, that's an area where the Mets could have done better, particularly last year, uh, where they were getting a lot of production from their stars, but they kind of needed – a little bit more from a second or third tier group. And they never really got that, um, particularly like at the DH position or whatever it was. It just it never really helped them, the bullpen, that kind of thing. And that's just something that David Stearns is really good at. And that's identifying players that will help um, maybe not push you to the playoffs or anything, but anything like that. But it will help you navigate 162 games because he brings this idea of every roster spot is vital and he's going to get the most of it so he's a master at 
uh, the 40 man roster. And he is a really big advocate of depth. And I think also what he does well is with the Brewers, they really have this principle of we have to know our players, our own players better than anybody else. And so that goes to that continuity point that I made about, okay, well, how do you do that? Well, you get the right coaches and you get like the right coordinators and the, and the right people in player development to understand like these guys and to learn your players. Therefore, when it comes to be making trades or when it comes to roster decisions for the 40 man roster, you're in position to make the absolute best call and not look like a fool a year later. And so that's what David Stearns in a nutshell is really good at all those things. And particularly the last one I mentioned of knowing your players. So that brings us to Billy Epler, who is expected to remain on and work under Stearns. We know there's a relationship there. And Joe and I on this podcast, we defend Epler, I think, more than a lot of the general consensus lands on him. Um, and we think that, you know, he has made good moves. You could start with Kodai Senga absolutely being maybe his shining star of a move. And we know the kind of handle he has on scouting in Japan. What do you think the dynamic between these two will be like? Because I, I like that the Mets here are looking at this and going, OK, we have Stearns, but it doesn't mean we throw aside Epler. Maybe we can really have Epler narrow in on what we think he succeeds at. So with Billy Epler, uh, same thing with David Stearns in the sense that like what I was saying earlier about how much of a reputation or how strong the reputation is for David Stearns. You can kind of say the same thing about Billy Epler, maybe for some different reasons, but a lot of agents really appreciate his communication. Players really like him uh, because of his transparency with them at all times. And executives across baseball really have positive things to say about him as well. So I think he's a good guy to keep in your front office. As far as the dynamic and how that may play, I think it's worth mentioning that you know Matt Arnold, who is – in charge now of the Brewers was essentially the GM of the Brewers while David Stearns was there as well. And I would say even like when, even before David Stearns earned the job or the title of president of baseball operations, Matt Arnold was the de facto number two guy. And I don't think that those two guys had a shared history before that either. Um, that was somebody that, you know, Billy Epler, I mean, excuse me, David Stearns thought highly of, and wanted to bring a board because of his background, his experience, particularly in scouting. Uh, and he thought he needed that. And I think the same thing Billy Epler brings to the table. He's a very strong scout, a very strong evaluator, evaluator of talent. And I think we've seen that with some of the, these offseason moves. Um, if we look at like why the Mets struggled in 2023, a lot of it could be attributed to guys who didn't really perform up to like their standard who had been here already. Uh, maybe you could kind of point to Marte as a as Starling Marte as somebody that, well, Epler brought him in the year before, but that guy posted an all-star season and earned down vote MVP, you know, consideration. So um, I think with all the moves that Epler made for the most part, like you, you may do a, a handful of them at least over again, whether that was Justin Verlander or Tommy Pham or David Robertson or uh, Adam Adovino or could I sing it? Like you mentioned, Connor, like th those were, those were not bad moves by yeah. any means, right? It's just the idea or my idea of where Epler maybe struggled or maybe didn't do what David Stearns can probably do better or what has earned some criticism from Billy Epler is like what I was saying earlier about the margins where they didn't upgrade those small areas that over the course of 162 games make a big difference and could be the deciding factor between those one or two games with Atlanta last year. And maybe it could have helped you if you had a better bullpen this year with some of the struggles that they were facing um, in May and June. Do you think the hire of David Stearns has any impact on Buck Showalter returning in 2024? Or do you think uh, that was something that was going to play out the way it is anyway? I think it certainly could. Uh, I think it definitely could. Um, I don't I don't have a good read on 100% if he will be back or not when I have asked people um, within the Mets, whether that was Steve Cohen or somebody else, it's it's always been the answer. Well, he's got the one year on this contract and we think he's done a great job. Okay, well, is he going to 100% be back in, in 2024? Sometimes you don't always get a straight answer on that. And then rightfully so, like that's not a totally unusual, right? Um, until something gets finalized. And frankly, like maybe Buck Schulter himself has something to say about that as well, because this is a little bit of a different job than what he signed up for too, perhaps, right? Because he um, came back into baseball and was looking to manage a team that 
uh, was on the cusp of probably being pretty good and was going to make some big time moves and they did. And now I don't want to say that they're, they're not like necessarily in rebuild mode, but it's a, taking a step back from the talent level clearly so far, um, depending on what they do this off season. So we'll see. Um, we'll see. David Stearns has never hired a manager, of course, because he inherited Craig Council. And even at the AAA level, he didn't have to make a hire there because the Brewers have had the same AAA manager even before David Stearns. So it's kind of like, it's, it's, it would be foreign territory for me. And there's not a whole lot of people that you can kind of point to and be like, oh, that would be David Stearns' guy. Um, so like that part is a little bit unclear too. Will, we've been a big fan of your work since you started covering this team, and it's been a long time. We've been looking forward to having you on this podcast. So for all of that work, of course, guys, check it out at The Athletic. You could follow him on Twitter, at Will Salmon. Thank you so much for the time. This was awesome stuff. We really appreciate it. Connor, Joe, thanks for having me, guys. You guys do awesome work yourselves. Appreciate it. All right, great stuff from Will Salmon of The Athletic. Of course, a lot of David Stern's talk, a lot of awesome info. And a reminder, you're listening to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Of course, you can watch all of our episodes on SMY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, time for our second guest of the episode. Yes, second guest who joins us for a very special edition of Down on the Farm, something that we do pretty much every week. Now we got a guy coming on that knows these players pretty well. The voice of the Binghamton Rumble Ponies, Jacob Wilkins, who's here to talk to us about all the big name Mets AA prospects who are about to start the Eastern League playoffs. Hey, who said the Mets pod wouldn't get to do a playoff preview show <laughs> this year? Jacob, thanks for bringing the energy. How are you? Hey, Connor, Joe, thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And we are so excited for, for tonight's game. This is the first Rumble Ponies playoff appearance since 2017. It's the first one in my tenure. I started with the club in 2019. So uh, really, really going to be a cool atmosphere tonight. Well, speaking of atmosphere, a guy that just seems to thrive off of that is Jet Williams. What kind of spark has he provided for this team? You know, Connor, this has been a second half of sparks. It seems like every day there's, I mean, this started really at the trade deadline with Luis Angel Acuna and Drew Gilbert and Jeremiah Jackson, who I think is an awesome player too, um, really igniting this offense. And I think even before that, it started with JT Schwartz. He had missed 64 games due to an injury. Um, he had a great start to the year, and then he was on a tear in a series against New Hampshire um, where he just lit up everything, and he's been a steady force in this offense. And then you bring Parada into the mix, and you bring Tidwell – and that's been part of this playoff push. And Jed is sort of the icing on the cake. He's remarkably poised and just being around him briefly uh, for a 19-year-old. Um, and to see the speed, that's clearly apparent. Um, and the way that Acuna and Williams, they can almost create their own runs, getting on base, then advancing to second on a stolen base, getting to third on a wild pitch, and then they're able to score on a sack fly that others might not be able to score on. So uh, I know how highly regarded Jed obviously is within the organization, and we're starting to see uh, the beginning of that here. And certainly he, as a 19-year-old, gets to have that playoff experience right off the bat. It's as if you read our rundown because the next question was going to be <laughs> about Lu Luis on El Acuna. So what have been your biggest takeaways on Acuna since joining the organization? He obviously got off to a bit of a slow start, and but he's turned it on certainly of late. What has stuck out to you about Acuna? Yeah, it's the speed, Joe. It's the speed. Um, and I mean, when you have a guy that has over 55 stolen bases on the year and has been caught less, you know, no more than 10 times, that stands out. But it goes to that way and he had a multi-homer game uh, a few weeks back here um in hartford actually but yeah, i also the day after think... the day after i went he did nothing no one did anything <laughs> the day i went to the hartford game the next day he hit two parada homer and then the day after that gilbert hit two and parada homer but i digress joe you know why was not he more considerate uh, that you were going to be at that game joe's uh -huh. bad luck we could both <laughs> say it <laughs> well, at least you were in most of our games on the back end at Hartford. We kept on getting pushed back because of the rainouts. We started a, yeah. a suspended ga a game on Friday that continued on Sunday. Um, so that that's also a different story. But uh, I think with Luis Angel, it goes back to he can get on via an infield hit. Then he can get to second. His instincts um, are so are so you know natural, um, and he, 
he can just steal a base like that. And you see the way it helps out other hitters. I mean, they're getting not just better pitches to hit, but we've seen actually, usually Gilbert's been in the two spot. Um, we have seen quite a few catchers interference calls with Gilbert at the plate because catchers are trying to anticipate him stealing second. And just being able to score, as I said, on those sack flies, uh, you know, and, and balls that other guys wouldn't score on. I remember actually at Somerset, it was a pretty soft ground ball to first. The infield was playing in. Acuna ran from third and beat the throw. And we sort of, I joke, it's a trademark term, the Acuna trip around the bases um, because he just creates runs. And this is an offense that um, – we certainly – there were nice players in, in the first half, but even now, they're not necessarily scoring 10 or 11 runs, but they'll beat teams 5-2. to two, They'll beat teams 4-1. to one, um, And to be able to get that quick run in the first inning with Acuna leading off just sets the tone for the game. And with this pitching staff, not to uh, go ahead in your rundown as well again, but with this pitching staff, sometimes, many times, that's enough. On the other hand – you, you know, we talked about Acuna, but it felt like a wave of these guys arrived together. Uh, Drew Gilbert obviously comes over and hits the ground running. What was it like when the roster changed so rapidly after that Mets trade deadline? Because for us from afar, we're mm -hmm. watching on social media for the highlights. And it just felt like specifically those two guys. But as this wave came over after the trade deadline, Binghamton became must-see TV after all of that. Yeah, it, it was a game changer, Connor. And it's interesting. You look at last year, uh, and Joe, you know, we had, you know, the big three. It was Fady, Alvarez, Mauricio, and all the attention was on them. Um, but the Mets were still a team that was on their way to winning 101 games. And so um, it was, you know, there was certainly excitement about the future, but it was viewed more as the future until Beatty got the call up late and, and those guys got the call up a little bit later. Um but when you look at uh, this grouping, I think it was really unique in that for the first half of the year, again, great guys like Matt Rudick, JT, um, really strong relievers, and guys that even were with us um, up until recently, Brandon McElwain, Joe Swazi, uh, that have made a big dent, Wyatt Young at AAA. But certainly, once the Mets made that pivot, um, the attention that – has been on us has been like nothing I've ever seen before. I mean, the way it happened with the Scherzer trade, then you think, all right, you know, that's a pretty big deal to get back Acuna. Oh, wait, Verlander gets traded. That brings back Gilbert and Jackson to us, obviously, Ryan Clifford to Brooklyn. And that same week for Tidwell to be promoted, um, you know, I didn't really feel it, guys, until after basically uh, not to uh, tough up SNY too much, but the the uh, amount of clips that were showing up on social media and the response that was coming from that, I said, whoa, this is different, um, you know, because there was really a, a push to focus on these guys, I, I think, from the Mets. And I think the other time I really felt the difference was the week after, I believe we played – uh, I'm trying to remember who we played the week that the trade happened. Um, but the week after we played at Somerset. And so all the stars aligned that all the reporters from New York, uh, you know, obviously wanted to speak to, to the new guys and our pitchers and to be able to get the attention from MLB.com and, you know, guys like Anthony DeComo and Tim Healy. Uh, you know, it felt like a major league environment. Um, and obviously SNY was there and, and, um, that's really when it also hit that I think Tim Healy wrote it. He said, this is uh, an event that you usually don't see in a minor league setting, uh, even in a big market, just the amount of people that were there. Um, and to be able to have them speak with six different, seven different guys, actually, that have accomplished so much. So how exciting has it been to watch this pitching staff over the last couple of months? Because, you, you mentioned Blake Tidwell, but there's Christian Scott, there's Tyler Stewart. There's, it, it feels like every day you got the opportunity to see one of the Mets top pitching prospects. And I, I know all the attention is going to be on Acuna and Gilbert and Jet yeah. Williams and Parada rightfully so, but show some love to the pitching staff and, and talk about some of the guys that you have down there. Yeah. The team's not here without the pitching staff, but even in this second half push, um, I still view this team as a pitching and defense first team and that's really in the mold of Reed Brignac um, who was a great shortstop in his own right 
Um, and so this team's always had the fundamentals buttoned up. But I think Dom Hamill, a guy all year. Mike Vassell at the beginning of the year. Um, Luis Moreno, was an, and Vassell was an Eastern League pitcher um, of the month in May. Moreno, an Eastern League pitcher of the week, had thrown five no-hit innings. Um, and the bullpen guys, like Nate Lavender, who I saw Anthony DeCone wrote about, you know, in his newsletter for, for MLB.com. Incredible. You know, and not a hard thrower, but a guy that knows how to locate. Um, Tyler Thomas has been with us. Uh, and it just seems, guys, like it's almost like plug and play. I know it's not that easy, but how many times it became sort of a deja vu scenario of bringing guys up that were making their double-A debut, and they'd be lights out. And I think it started with Christian Scott who's starting tonight in the playoff game. It continued with Stewart, where there had been all this buzz about him having the MILB leading mark in ERA. And then a guy like Yoander Suarez comes up, starts with 17 no hit, 17 consecutive scoreless frames. He pitches a no-hitter in his second start um, over seven innings at Hartford and retired the last 20. He faced the minimum 21. Um, and so it's just continued to be uh, an abundance of riches um, when it comes to the pitching staff. And um, and Blade Tidwell, of course, who is, you know, I think one of his best starts came at Somerset in one of those late morning games um, a few weeks back. So certainly I think, I don't think this is hyperbole, and I don't even think it's opinion. The Rumble Ponies have had the best pitching staff um, in the league, a lot of credit goes to A.J. Sager, uh, the pitching coach. He was with Brooklyn last year, so he was really familiar with quite a few of these guys that were making that move up. He's very pragmatic. He's um, a very soft-spoken, but it, it, he can deliver the message simply, but they're listening. And um, this staff has had 14 shutouts this year, um, and that's a franchise record, so... I think that that tells you all you need to know from from how good they've been. But if you don't have the bullpen behind them, obviously guys aren't throwing complete games every night. So to have those lockdown guys that can win you a 4-3 game um, is really important too. Jacob, you've covered so many players in such an excellent way. And a lot of the fa names fans do know they've at least heard of. Who's maybe, and it could be somebody you already mentioned, but we just don't get to talk about him enough. Who's a player that's really underrated in the eyes at the top level that Mets fans need to know? Yeah, I'll give you two. One who joined us recently and one who's been here the whole year. Uh, the first who has been here the whole year is Rowdy Jordan, uh, who fans may very well know from being on a uh, championship team with Mississippi State. Um, Rowdy is he's a great guy and has been so versatile in playing different positions. You put him in center, he's got range. He's played all three outfield positions. But he's also, more uh, earlier in the year, has played a lot of second base. And he's played third base. And he's just been so smooth in being able to adjust. He was actually an infielder in high school. They moved him at Mississippi State to playing center field. And Rowdy's now on an eight-game hitting streak, and he's just a resilient player. Got off to a slow start, then went on a tear. Came out of the second half um, in a bit of a slump. Now he's back to driving in a lot of runs. And this team, last week, for instance, Rowdy comes up, um, and he's such a strong guy. He's really built up a lot of uh, lower half strength or lower body strength over the offseason and continues to in season. But last week against Reading, and ponies had clinched already. Yeah, they're going for the division, but it's not going to affect how they're, you know, where their uh, positioning is. Down one nothing heading into the bottom of the ninth, and Rowdy hits uh, a walk off two run double with the bases loaded. Rowdy has had three walk off hits this year, um, <laughs> so um, he's certainly a clutch player. The other guy is Rylan Thomas, um, hitting three fifty three on a twelve game hitting streak. Seems very smooth out in left field um, and very comfortable. Obviously comes with a lot of pedigree, played on the Cape, played at USC. And you forget, guys, most of these guys that we're talking about are either in their first full professional season, maybe their second full professional season. Uh, Jet's obviously 19. He's in a whole different category. But at least for me, I was not as well adjusted uh, at 20 or 21. And these guys handle seem to handle the pressure uh, pretty smoothly. When you mention uh, the down to the last out big moment, you have to talk mm -hmm. about Drew Gilbert hitting a ball out of the stadium when they were down to the last out. Uh, <laughs> what what has been Drew Gilbert 
covering him on a day-to-day -day basis, what has stood out as far as uh, him since he's joined the organization where he's clearly just hit since day one since coming over? Yeah, I, I think Drew, we, you know, when you talk to people that see Drew play for the first time, they're, they're almost uh, drooling. Um, they're just uh, really amazed. Um, and I think it goes back to something uh, that Billy Epler, he came up and paid a visit to, to Binghamton um, about a month ago. And he said, Drew's a guy that plays with his hair on fire and that you have to come and see him to almost get the full experience. And uh, I think that's what fans, scouts see when they're, they're at the ballpark, uh, coaches. Um, he does play with his hair on fire. That's that's exactly the type of player he is. He chases down every ball. Um, he is an intense guy, but in the best way, um, very focused, very structured, um, tough on himself, almost has a, a Paul O'Neill type quality to him. And um, I'm I'm very impressed. Uh, his range is is incredible in center field, um, and and he's a guy where the intensity just. Is, is contagious and, and permeates throughout the club. And he's quite the hitter. You saw that home run in Hartford. Um, he's got power. He's got tools to the gap. Um, I have been nothing but impressed uh, by Drew. And he's a guy you just have confidence in when he comes to the plate that he's coming to the plate with a plan. He is the voice of the Binghamton Rumble Ponies, Jacob Wilkins. Of course, you could follow him on Twitter at Jacob Wilkins to keep up with this young, exciting team. Man, we're excited for these playoffs, and we were even more excited to talk to you about this roster. Thank you so much, Jacob. Connor, Joe, thanks for the time. Anytime. Excited for this run. A big thanks to Jacob Wilkins, of course, as the Binghamton Rumble Ponies start their playoffs. Joe, uh, at least some form of the Mets organization has some high-stakes games coming up. You'll love to see it. And we have a high-stakes game. Continuing going, it's not gone well for me in this over uh, this last couple of weeks. The scoreboard, of course, or as Joe likes to say, the scorecard. And as we joked off the air, if Joe wins, he might get to rename the entire dang segment. So listen, it was the all Jet Williams edition last week, uh, which did not go well for me. Let's just be honest here. Over under push set at six for Jet Williams hits in his first six Binghamton games. And Joe, you went over. I went over. He only had five. He went right under there. No points awarded over under push set at four for Jet Walks in his first six Binghamton games. Joe, you went under. I went with the push. He didn't have a single walk from that game on. So he finishes with one. He goes under a point for Joe. Over under push for Jet Williams doubles was set at three for his first six games. Of course, Joe, you went under. I went with the push. He had one. Joe wins again. Joe. Joe's strategy was to doubt his favorite prospect, and it and it paid off so far for him. Unbelievable. The last one was over under push set at two. Jet Williams hit by pitch in his first six Binghamton games. When we recorded, he already been hit once, so he just needed to get hit one more time. I'm glad he didn't, but I'm not glad that I was wrong. Joe went under. He was right. I went with the push. Joe gets three points on the week. I get none. Joe leads the season 25 to 19. I have a lot of ground to make up, so thank you to producer Jeff for giving me a chance with extra questions. A little rapid fire scoreboard here, Joe. And the first one, since you won, I'll give you the floor as I always do. Over under push is set at two for Pete Alonzo home runs in the next six games. I will push this. Uh, he's at 45. I think I said I'm Mets off day live. I predict he'll have 47. Uh, so I think he will get those two here in the next week. I think we're going to see a lot of home run hacks from Pete trying to get to 50 as fast as he possibly can. I'll go big on this one. I'll go over. I'm also playing him in my fantasy championship. So that these things just find a way to kind of work out uh, a certain way. All right. The next one, Jeff McNeil hits in the next six games over under push is set at six. Joe, I will go with the under. I think McNeil might be batting toward a little later in the order. It's on a power streak right now. Kind of odd for Jeff McNeil. I think four home runs in his last about 50-ish at-bats. But I will go under for McNeil hits in six games. Where are you going? I will push this as well. I think Jeff is on a really hot, hot streak. So I don't I don't know that he's, he's going to start to struggle now in the next six. So, you know, I might be too low. I think you going under is the wrong play. Well, you could have just pick the same answer as me and you'll easily win this with the six point lead but you have. So I give you respect what, for not. What fun is that? What fun exactly, is that? I'm not no saying I'll, I'm not saying I'll do none of that, but I'm not going to do it. 
Over under push at seven for Kodai Senga uh, strikeouts in his next start. Joe, you have the floor. I will go over. I think he's been a strikeout machine. Uh, Maybe it's eight, but Kodai Senga is showing he has the propensity to miss bats at uh, some of the highest levels amongst starting pitchers in baseball. Yeah, Kodai Senga quietly in the, he's a long shot, but quietly in the Cy Young picture right now. I will go with the push of seven. Once again, I need to make up some ground here, but I still believe in Senga. The next one, Mark Bianto's home runs in the next six games. Over under push is set at one. Joe, I'm going to take the push here. Where are you going for Vientos home runs? I'm going to join you. Um, this one, I will join yeah. you. I'll go push. I think Vientos is starting to hit the ball hard, and you're starting to see it get off the ground, which is going to be big for him going forward. Yeah, he's looked a lot better. And speaking of somebody that he hasn't looked better because he's always looked great, Ronnie Mauricio steals in the next six games is set at two here, Joe. Where are you going for Mauricio Steals? He has just been phenomenal, uh, not only with the hits, but making things happen on the base paths. He's stealing at such a rate. I I, I want to say he wants to make a case and just keep going, but uh, I'll push. I'll say two stolen bases this week. I will go with the over then for Ronnie. I think he just keeps on running, and more importantly, he's getting on base. Okay, the next one, Francisco Alvarez home runs in the next six games is set at one. Alvarez is super, super streaky. We know that Johnny Bench number of 26 is maybe not on his mind, but it's on a lot of people's mind. I think Alvarez hits two home runs this week, Joe. I'm going to take the over. Okay, I will go push. I don't want to say he's going to hit none because he's Francisco Alvarez and we love him. So I'll say push for one. The second to last one, DJ Stewart home runs in the next six games. Stewart has cooled off a little bit, right? It felt like it was not sustainable what he was doing. His home runs is set at one, Joe. What do you like here? I've learned to not doubt TJ Stewart, I think, but sometimes you just don't learn the lessons you're supposed to. So I'm going to go under no home runs for DJ Stewart this week. I will take the push. Stewart puts one over the fence. The last one, Luis Guillorme hits in the next six games. The over under push is set at two. Joe, I'm going with the under. Where are you going to close us out? I'm going to go under. I don't know how much he's going to play. I don't know if he's going to play every single day. Like, Beatty might be back sometime this week. Like he's still been day to day. So uh, we'll see what's up with Brett Beatty, but I'll join you on the under on Guillaume. All right. Uh, We're going to close out with one mailbag question here because it just feels wrong. No matter how long our episodes are. And we were really fortunate today to have two great uh, guests on Will Salmon and Jacob Wilkins, but we got time for a question because we always do. And this was my favorite one. I saw in your mentions. This is from at an insane Mets fan. Outside of Yamamoto, what pitchers would you and Connor target for the Mets to fill out their 2024 rotation? Would you embrace a spring training competition for the number five starter spot? So, Joe, I'll let you go longer on that second part and, of course, give your idea of who your ideal is. I have been pretty consistent in that if you get Yamamoto, sign me up for a Jordan Montgomery as the other guy. And with the way he's pitched, maybe... Since he got acquired by the Texas Rangers at the deadline, maybe Montgomery is not that, hey, fill out the rotation guy. Maybe it's some real money for him because we know how much pitching costs. But man, sign me up for a rotation of Yamamoto, Senga, Montgomery, Quintana. And then, of course, that leaves time to talk about that five spot. But who are the names that you like, Joe, in the pitching market? I think Jordan Montgomery is probably pricing himself into not crazy money, but not number Short four term three. yeah i think he's probably pricing himself up a little bit uh which is a credit to him uh I, i'm looking at short-term one-year type of things like what's hinjin ryu gonna get uh who's been pitching well of late for yeah, toronto coming back from tommy john surgery you have to keep an eye on luis severino with billy epler's yankee ties i know this year has been all kinds of trouble for severino but uh check his health out i think he's someone that could be on the radar Honestly, when you look up and down this pitching market, there's there's a lot of names. Like we could we could spend some time, which is kind of my answer to I don't really want a competition for the fifth spot. I know that um I often I'm often into the whole competing is good for everybody, but I like the fact that they have Mike Vassell in tow in triple A, David Peterson, Tyler McGill, now Jose Butos inserting himself into the picture. Uh Joey Lucchese is potentially depth like these are guys that are under control for next year i want that depth to be so strong 
that if there are injuries, if there are things that go awry uh, for the Mets next season, that they're not turning to someone they really don't want to. And I imagine that's, uh, as Will Salmon told us earlier, that uh, David Stearns likes to maximize his 40-man roster. He values depth. That leads me to believe, uh, you know, maybe it's two of those reclamation projects. Maybe it's a, a Ryu and a Severino, just an example. Jack Flaherty is another name to throw into the mix. Like these are guys that um, have high upside, but they come with obviously some risk. And I think that'll be baked into the contract they get. Maybe it's short term, maybe it's incentive laden, maybe it's, um, you know, player option, things like that. So I, I wouldn't be so into it because I know there's, there's, there's no, Time for another question, but like I know there's someone about Mike Vassell competing for the fifth spot. And to me, I would try to fill out the rotation with legitimate major league pitchers. And then the depth can be the guys I mentioned, then even Dom Hamill, Christian Scott, the guys that Jacob told us about that were spending time in Binghamton that are uh, going to be making their way up and be close to the big league. So Mets are trending in the direction that internally they're going to be able to support a lot of their starting pitching depth. Now it's time to just fill the rotation out for 2024 with outside additions, in my opinion. This is the Mets pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. And a reminder to subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch on SMY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll catch you next week.